lost in a cave. The candle flickered and sputtered. The little flame glittered in the darkness. All around the two children, the darkness was like a big mouth, opening its jaws to swallow them. Sam Clemens had the candle high for Laura to see the shining ceiling of stylistics. The candle bobbed and died, sprang up again. There was hardly more than the length of a boy's thumb left to the light their way back. Are we lost, Sam? Lord asked in frightened voice. Sam was afraid to tell the truth. He thought of how the two of them had been safe with the rest of the picnic party picnic party less than an hour before all the school children and few adults their chaperons had started out joyously to explore the cave over the children's screams of delight and acclamation of awe the adults had warned them again and again not to drift away but Sam knew the cue. He was already savoring Laura's delight there when he showed her a part of the cue. None of the others would explore. He thought of how envious the other boys and girls would be when he and Laura returned and told of their adventures. He had pulled Laura behind, whispering, You want to see something special? Something none of the others know about. Laura had looked around hesitantly. The cave was dark and cold. There was beds in some of the passages. She was afraid. Sam knew. But the last thing in the world she wanted to show was her fear. They had stolen away from the party at one of the branches passages. They had a supply of candles and Sam was sure he knew the way. They started down winding passage holding the candle high and reading the names of the people who had written who had been there before them and scratched their names on the walls. Although most of the names were familiar, here and there was a strange one. Was it someone long ago who had put his name here and then left Hannibal to move west? Sam and Laura did not know, but they made up stories to go with the names. In many places, the walls of the cave were blackened by the smoke of other candles of long ago, and the passages had dark, frightening look. But... Sam confidently led the way. Well, he would show her underground lakes and places where he thought maybe there was buried treasure. He would take her to the secret room where his gang met. Are we lost, Sam? Laura repeated, and Sam interrupted his rivier and looked around. They were lost all right, but he did not want to say so. We will just go a little further, he said confidently. And when if we don't find this passage I am looking for, we will start back. I want to start back now, she said, stopping and clutching his hand. I am afraid. He looked at her. Her lower lips was trembling and her eyes were filling with tears. Now don't you cry, he said. You just come a little way further and we will. But he did not know quite what they would do. A way back, that was all he kept hoping that they would find. But nothing looked familiar. At the end of the passage, they came to a pool formed by water tumbling over a rock ledge and gathering in a wide cup in the floor. Sam wanted to cheer Laura up. 
he wanted to cheer himself up and he placed the candle behind the falling water the little shaft of light threw sparks of color on the water and reflected against the limestone ledge which looked like a ruffle around the rim of the bright water isn't it pretty he asked anxiously trying to coax a smile from her let's go back laura said let's turn around and go back then she looked earnestly at him at sam you do know the way back don't you sami we can go back can't we but sam had forgotten his own fears behind the ledge of the of water he had discovered a natural rock stairway look he cried excitedly look here what i found come on let's explore if there was one thing in the world sam clemens loved to do it was to explore the children stumbled along the stairway laughing and joking laura forgotting laura had forgotten her fears and was as excited as sam at the top of the stairway there was a large room like a cathedral sam said remembering the pictures in his school books and pleased at the admiring look at laura gave him they crossed the wide floor of the inner cave and started down a passage which was lined with stalactites cities at the bottom of the narrow tunnel there was a spring and when sam helped up the candle they saw a fairy land and reflected in the water the water rippled and shone as tiny drops fell from the ceiling the stalactites were mirror in the candlelit surface of the pool the basin of the little lake was a glittering frost work of crystals it's just beautiful laura said at last i never saw anything so beautiful in my life let's go back and tell the others i want them to see come to see he her voice was so determined that sam knew there was nothing he could say to change her mind well he said hesitantly well but laura had already run up to him and was tugging at his hand give me a candle too she said i want to look i don't have too many more that just one he said feeling in his pocket maybe we better save that but we are going right back we are sam clemens she said angrily you take me right back this minute and she stamped her foot he nodded miserably and started back across the vast cavern but there were three passages that opened out at the far end he looked at laura fearfully do you remember which one we came in by he asked timidly timid timidly no i don't laura said i think i think it was this one but at that moment a vast knock of bed shone in the candlelight they were bunch together and hanging from the roof of the first tunnel at the sound of her voice they dropped from the ceiling and began to fly about squeaking and swooping about the children's head oh laura said scream covering her hair oh bats she had both arms over her head and was huddled against sam oh they will get in my hair she screamed stand still sam commanded they can't see you they can only hear you do don't shout like that just stand stand still i will lead you he dragged the frightened girl down another passage but it was the wrong one 
there was no stone stairway staircase like the one they had come up i guess we took wrong turn he said at last i think i may, i think maybe we would better go back and look for the other one i am not going near those beds again laura said determinedly but sam led the way praying that he would come to a place that looked familiar now neither he nor laura spoke they walked on searching each passage way for a place they knew finally sam just looked took any passage hoping he would stumble on the right one with luck laura was so frightened that she could hardly hold back the tears finally she said i don't care if the beds are back there let's go back and find the place we know but sam was standing very still his ears cocked to one side what is it laura demanded do you hear something do you hear the others she asked hopefully sam had been sure he had heard voices now he and laura stood very still in the middle of the darkness the candle was now extremely low and sam searched his pocket pulling out the last tiny stub he lit the new candle from old one if only someone would see light see the light and come for them but all around was deep silence there was no voices no sound of footstep finally sam shouted here we are here there was no answer at last he and laura turned and t- tried to retrace their steps now laura was openly crying no longer trying to hold back the tears sam himself felt close to weeping but he put on a brave face they crept along the inky corridor laura looking about fearfully for beds they looked a passage went a short way and came up against a stone wall dead end now sam knew that they were truly lost he could not even find his way his way back to the part of the cave where the beds were i never thought i would be glad to see those beds again Laura wait, wailed, but I would give anything to Sam. We are lost. We are lost. We will never find our way out of this awful cave. Oh, why did we ever leave the others? To Sam's horror, the, she sank to the floor of the cave and commenced to cry as if her heart would break. He tried to comfort her, but. it was no use her sobs echo against the walls and sounded like horrible laughter for a long time they remained that they that way laura on the floor crying sam awkwardly trying to comfort her finally she wiped her eyes with her hands and tried to bring up a smile well she said i guess there's nothing to do but keep looking they started out again and this time they went more slowly carefully exploring each section of the passageway in the hope of finding some mark that would show them the way sam tried shouting but at last he grew hoarse and had to give it up the candle in his hand was dangerously low it was only last a few more minutes they turned into a passage way and candle flickered died down and threatened to go out here we are sam shouted in desperation here just as the candle was about to go out he heard an answering voice far down the passage sam whooped and yelled gradually the voices came closer just as sam's last candle died out sam never forgot that experience in the cave with laura hawkins years later he used it 
was the basis of one of his most exciting passages in Tom Sawyer, where Sam became Tom, became Tom, and Laura was Becky Thatcher, the boyhood. The boyhood experiences of Sam Clemens were to make material for much of the writing of the Mark Twain, writing of the man Mark Twain. For the two were one and the same. Mark Twain was born Samuel Langhorn Clemens in Florida, Missouri, on November thirty, eighteen thirty-five, when he was four. The family moved to Hannibal, a village of fifteen hundred people. The Clemens family consisted of Judge John Marshall Clemens, his wife Jenny, and their four children, Pamela, Orion Sam, and Henry. The move was the last of the long series of hopeful moves that Sam's father had made. John Clemens was originally from Virginia. one of the southern aristocrats who had left home to seek his fortune as a young man john clemens had been fairly wealthy and had great promise as a lawyer he had invested 400 dollars a considerable sum in those days to buy close to 100000 acres of land in tennessee In eighteen thirty-four, during a national panic, the rest of his fortune was wiped out. The judge never seemed to overcome the bad luck that started. Then he got nowhere with law. He could. He could not do anything with his huge tract of land in the ten in Tennessee. Whatever he tried failed. But John Clemens always held. on to this tennessee land he always believed that one day it would make the family rich after he lost his money the judge tried several ventures he kept store unsuccessfully he rose to justice of the peace and was elected to the surrogate court but misfortune still dogged him he went security for A friend, Ira Stout, and Stout later declared himself bankrupt, leaving the judge to honor the debt. Although the judge was not legally responsible to return the money, he felt morally obliged to do so. He believed strongly in the value of a man's man's promise. He believed that no gentleman ever went back on his word. and he given his word therefore he would repay the money that his friend owed though for years his own family suffered he religiously met the debts but the obligations made him old before his time he brood he brooded on the injustice of stout's behavior and he thought of his own years of hardship and priva- privation he became silent and withdrew and withdrawn a stone unbending man his son sam wrote of him of splendid common sense when he climbed upon his three leg stool wrapped on the box which served as a desk and demanded silence in the court it was fully expected silence would reign sam's mother jenny claims clemens was the last thing from somon order she was the kind of person people like to have around always gave laughing and witty she had be she had been a graceful dancer in her day and she went out her way whenever she could take part in the town gaiety her life was built on laughter laughter and affection she was always lavishing attention on her children and her 
pets sam's mother adored animals her weakness for animal was legendary in hannibal the clemens marriage was not built on love but the mother and father respected one another and they lived for their children it might be hard for the judge to show his wife but sam's mother had no such difficulty she went to the other extreme forgiving her children their worst behavior especially sam sam was her favorite by the time sam was 8 he was sturdy and healthy and constantly in trouble getting lost in the cave laura hawkins was nothing out of the ordinary for him the dawn of the dawn of each new day shown on the latest of sam's adventures and miss edwin at Ad, miss adventures years later sam sat down with his mother and asked her how she had survived his mischief she admitted that she had been worried about him he was always on her mind she confessed i suppose that during all that time you were uneasy about about me sam asked her yes the whole time she admitted afraid i wouldn't leave his mother was silent a moment as if remembering all his boyish pranks no afraid you would she said after a pause a twinkle in her eyes that was the kind of sense of humor that and live and live on the family's life the key the kind and the kind that sam himself inherited from the, his mother the town of hannibal provided the ideal background for a boy who liked to get into trouble there were the caves a mile or so from town where the where sam and laura had wandered away from the picnic party and gotten lost there were cottonwood forests nearby with tamping swimming holes and abundant hunting grounds there were boys in town who were eager to share in the excitement and adventures of hunting for buried treasure or organizing secret clubs there was the endless trading of boys prizes to enliven the interest of their school hours and above all there was the mighty river the mississippi running right by the town on the river young sam clements could learn the whole lore of nature before he, his eyes a fascinating world unfolded that was 10 times as real as the ones he read about in his school books he could touch and smell and see it the school books seemed dry and dead beside the real thing the river sam said years later was my school sam loved to swimming swim and fish and borrow a boat to drift down river with with the current but he and his friends were never happier than when they were camping out on one of the island of the road one of the island of the broad mississippi there is a description of such an expedition in tom swear where the feelings of young sam are put into the words of the of tom when tom awoke in the morning he wondered where he was he sat up and rubbed his eyes and looked around then he comprehended it was the cool gray dawn and there was a delicious sense of repose and peace in the deep pervading 
calm and silence of the woods not a leaf stirred not a sound attributed of treaded upon great nature's meditation bedded drew dew drops stood upon the leaves and grasses a white layer of ashes covered the fire and a thin blue breath of smoke rose straight into the air young sam clemens had observed the marvelous of nature closely speaking of tom swear he says now far away in the woods a bird called another answered presently the hammering of a woodpecker was heard gradually the cool dim gray of the morning whitened and as gradually sounds multiplied and life manifested itself the marvel of nature shaking off sleep and going to work unfolded itself to the musing boy a little green worm came crawling over a dew, dewy leaf lifting to lifting two thirds of his body into the air from time to time and sniffing around then proceeding again for he was measuring tom said and when that worm approached him of its own accord he sat as still as a stone with his hoofs rising and falling by turns as the creature still came toward or seemed inclined to get to go elsewhere and when at last it considered a painful moment with its curled body in the air and then came decisively down upon tom's leg and began a journey over him his whole heart was glad for that moment for that meant he was going to have a new suit of clothes without the shadow of a doubt a gaudy piratical uniform amidst such splendor tom sam could not contain himself he awoke his friends and the pirates were soon stripped and running for the water they fought and trembled and chased each other shouting the singing they felt no long no longing for the little village sleeping in the distance beyond the majestic water majestic waste of water a a vagrant current or slight rise in the river had carried off their raft but this only gratified them since its going was something like burning the bridge between them and civilization it was little wonder that sam clemens found school hard going when the great river beckoned him every minute the daily life of hannibal went on at the same steady slow pass as that of the river then suddenly a whistle would sound there would be a shout steam boat a coming and the whole town would burst into action within minutes men were running for the docks boys had dropped their books or deserted their course and were scrambling for the landing the store closed down and the owner and customers flocked down the street to see the arrival of the fabulous stone wheeler and to gaze in silence envy at her pilot the life of a river pilot was so glamorous that the permanent dream of every boy long, along the mississippi was to take his place at the wheel of a great steamboat and be saluted as a king of the river young sam clemens of hannibal missouri dreamed the same dream as the rest other exciting times in the village where the arrival of a minstrel show 
ए ट्रैवलिंग माइंड रीडर साम हिमसेल्फ एट द एज ऑफ फोर्टीन और फिफ्टीन बीकेम द टाउन हीरो वेन ए हिप्नोटिस्ट केम टू हनीबाल विद ग्रेट फैन फेयर देर वेर साइंस ऑल ओवर टाउन एडवर्टाइजिंग द शो ट्वेंटी फाइव सेंट फॉर एडल्ट एंड चिल्ड्रन हाफ प्राइज द नाइट आफ्टर द फर्स्ट परफॉर्मेंस नो वन इन हनी बाल कूड टॉक ऑफ एनी थिंग एल्स साम वॉज एज एंथ्रॉल्ड एज एवरी वन एल्स ही सेट माई नाइट आफ्टर नाइट इन द ऑडियंस ट्राइंग टू हिप्नोटाइज हिम सेल्फ बाय गेजिंग एट द हिप्नोटिस्ट मैजिक डिस्क ग्रोन मैन एंड वीमेन ऑल अराउंड साम वेयर परफॉर्मिंग इन द मोस्ट outrageous we but all the magic disc did was make him sleepy finally as he says on the fourth night he could no longer resist temptation after gazing at the disc for for a time he pretended to come under his its spell then the hypnotist ran over and began waving his arms and snapping his fingers over sam's head the man held held the disc under sam's eyes and slowly moved away from him leading sam toward the center of the stage saying that sam must not take his eyes off the disc sam was as wide awake as a boy could be but he said that upon suggestion i fled from snakes passed buckets at a fire became excited over hot steamboat traces made love to imaginary girls and kissed them fished from the platform and landed mud cats that outweighed me and so on all the customary marvels he threw himself into the part with vigor he was the best subject the hypnotist had ever had all the other subjects for instance had failed miserably when the hypnotist asked them what do you see but the sum was a mi- miracle of inven tiveness no matter what did notion he brought out everyone seemed pleased after sam's splendid performance the hypnotist took no other subject and sam became a town legend legend now night after night he went on pretending the most outlandish and foolish things it seems to sam absolutely unbelievable that even the town's wisest men were taken in by his foolishness but they all were that lessons which the hypnotist taught him that it doesn't take much to make the wise foolish beside the river entertainments the town came to life for the fourth of july celebration which was the most important one of the year more important even than christmas for hanibal was on the verge of the west end patriotic sentiments were strong there were also picnics usually with an excursion to the notorious cave of sam's books camp meetings and revivals there was skating in the winter and swimming in the summer on the river there was an endless contest to see who could catch biggest catfish and of course there was a school there was no getting away from it much a sam tried there were no public school in hanibal but there were two private ones run by mrs hor and mr sam cross pupils 
paid twenty five cents a week to attend. Sam started when he was four and a half with Mrs. Hoar, who taught in the in a small log cabin at the southern end of the main street. Sixty five years later, when Sam sat down to write his autobiography, he still remembered his first day at school. He violated the rule and was warned that if he did so again he would be whipped. A few minutes later he was caught in the same act. Mrs. Hoare told him to go out and find a switch. He looked around until he found a stick that was small, thin and rotten. He carried that to Mrs. Hoare. Then teacher then the teacher then announced that she would find boy a boy with better judgment in selecting switches. The boy she chose, Sam says, was an expert at the sort of thing. He came in with a good thick switch that looked vicious and turned out to be twice as bad as it looked. When it was applied to Sam's backside, Sam submitted to school. In time, the even, in time, he even became the champion speller. But his heart was always out of doors. He would sit at his desk, bent over a book, longing for a moment, for the moment he would be free to race to the swimming. Hole or to go down to the pier and watch for a boat to go by. He heard the sound of birds outside the schoolroom and his mind wandered. Soon he was daydreaming over his books, his thoughts down at the levee. His lessons forgotten. Sam's happiest times were the summers he spent on his uncle John Quarles' farm. Here he could be with the animals, watch planting, and take part in the farm life. Uncle John's farm was four miles from Florida, Sam's birthplace, and he went to the farm for two or three of the summer months every year from the time he was four until he was 11 or 12. John Quarles had eight children and double that number of slaves. The farm was a big one, but life went on in a relaxed manner. There was a large long house and a connecting kitchen where someone was always making a pie or cake that would tempt a boy's appetite. The farmyard was very large, fenced in one in on three sides by rails. There was a smokehouse for curing and storing meats, large orchard and a little village of Negro huts. The front yard was canopied by hickory and walnut trees and one of the favorite autumn pastimes of the children was gathering nuts. While Sam's family always had to scrape money together to get along, the quarrels had plenty and they were eager to share. The food was prodigious. There were butter, beans and string beans, tomatoes, peas, two kinds of white potatoes and always a big dish of sweet potatoes, buttermilk and sweet milk, clabber milk with which had thickened in souring and watermelons, muskmelons, cantaloupes and 
and assortment of pies, apple, peach, and pumpkin and berry. In contrast to his own stern father, Sam found in Uncle John's quarrels a, fa- a warmer, a warm humor and easygoing manner, and he loved his aunt Patsy, marvelous cooking and gentle touch. He loved to tease her too, particularly by particularly by putting a harmless snake in her sewing basket. This was a trick that could be repeated over and over and always produced a first rate reaction in his aunt who was terrified of any kind of snake. Some like the slaves too. The quarrels children. The quarrels children were always down at the slave quarters and Sam joined them to listen the to fascinating stories and incredible superstitions. He loved to listen to the singing and he spent hours memorizing their spirituals. Sam had a particular one friend that he always sought out, Uncle Daniel a middle-aged slave whose head was the best one in the Negro quarter, whose sympathies were wide and warm, and whose heart was honest and simple and knew no guile. Sam remembered and loved Uncle Daniels all his life, and years later, when Sam wrote The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, he used Uncle Daniel's character for the Negro Jim who goes down the Mississippi with Huck, Hannibal, and the countryside around might seem sleepy and peaceful. There were frequent drownings, and year after year, there was a terrible spectacle of one epidemic after another speeding through the port towns. The steamboats carried more than romance. They often were the means by which cholera and yellow fever spread up and down the Mississippi Valley. Medicines were so primitive in those days that the town pep the town paper in Hannibal recommended soap and courage as the treatment for cholera, flu, scarlet fever, pneumonia, mumps, most of the illness that we no longer consider serious, took many lives every year, particularly among the young. Measles was one of the most dead, dread childhood diseases and Sam himself nearly lost his life in the epidemic of 1845. Sam was 10 then, and most of his playmates were stricken. There was nearly a funeral a day. For some reason, however, Sam did not catch the disease. His mother made every effort to keep her children away from contagion. Week after week passed with the whole family waiting in fear for one more for one of them to come down with the measles. Finally, Sam grew t- tired of the suspense. He decided to settle a matter in his own way. A friend, Will Brown, lay dangerously ill and Sam sneaked by his own mother, crept into Will's house and got upstairs undetected. He was ready to climb into Will's bed when Will's mother discovered him and sent him home. But the second time Sam was more successful, this time he managed to get in bed with Will and remain long enough for the measures to take. It was a serious case and everyone thought Sam was going to die. There, The doctor was sent for sent for, and he put as Sam remembered hot ashes 
all over me he put them on my breast on my wrist on my ankles and so very much to his astonishment and doubtless to my regret he dragged me back into his into this world and set me going again doctor sin hanibal worked by the year charging a fee of 25 dollars for the whole family a good many of them furnishing medicines for the family as well castor oil was the main remedy castor oil accompanied by painkillers calomel or camelin rahab herb and jalap were next in popularity doctors in any case were never called in for ordinary complaints these were treated by the neighborhood wisdom all the old women in town concocted their own medicines and helped us their neighbors children as well as their own they would gather special herbs in the woods and compound these into formulas that had been passed along the from generation to generation it was a wonder some considered later that any of the children survived there were also many faith doctors old indians or negroes who had secret cures for the most common ache and alignments in hanibal there was an old woman outside of town who especially was curing the toothache she would seized a patient grab his jaw peer fiercely into his face and cry believe since there were no dentist the children preferred to let on they believe rather than submit to having doctor the doctor took his tongue and pull out any teeth which were giving trouble and if the jaw remained it was not his fault some said later